I'm uh, a retiring professor from the University of Texas. Uh, my PhD is actually in, in computer science. I'll try to convince you by the end of this presentation that I'm not a, an attorney, but I do teach evidence courses at law schools. I'm basically a forensic specialist. They say that all good computer security guys are paranoid. That's not really true. All good forensics guys are really super paranoid. So I'm going to show you some things today to really talk to you about an emerging area called tokens and tagants and why this is going to probably change a lot of stuff in uh, computer forensics, particularly as we start seeing uh, stranger file systems. Uh, this is supposed to be an hour and 15 minutes. I want to be pretty interactive. You'll see that I'm a professor, so if you don't ask questions, I'll ask you questions. How's that sound? Uh, those of you that were in my forensics class, here's a secret sign. You're all here, right? Okay, all my, all my forensic students were here for my two-day class. I want to talk today about digital information. I want to convince you there's a concept called user tokens. I would like to actually convince you also there's something called a tagant. I want to describe the idea there's a tension between security and forensics and also these, this idea of doing forensics investigations and personal privacy. You leave little digital artifacts every time you interact with a computer system. I will show you an example of some of these uh, today. Also, I want to build on your paranoia. These are not just computer systems. These are also cell phones. These are PDAs. These are things even like cameras. Uh, basically, we have lots of little tagants, and we have special kinds of data and metadata that is residing on devices. Increasingly, these are used in forensics investigations. Many of you heard an earlier presentation about, uh, about shredders. Uh, shredders are imperfect. There's no perfect shredder. I'm going to try that again. There are no perfect shredders. And given a determined forensics examiner, he can usually find some information. Even tools that are advertising, they charge you $69. Evidence, uh, uh, what is it, evidence uh, eliminator? Have you, have you ever gone to a website and looked at evidence, evidence uh, eliminator? They basically took a premier forensics tool, purchased the tool, and then decided to write a counter tool for anti-forensics. And they put this thing up on the web and they said for $69 we can eliminate any of your personal data and really we'll do anti-forensic stuff. Not a bad idea, but his marketing message is a little weak because he actually hired three, four, uh, three felons who are now in the slammer in prisons and said, if I had had evidence eliminator, I wouldn't be serving five years in Huntsville prison. So his, his marketing stuff is not really real cool. So I want to talk to you today also, we're going to talk a little bit about anti-forensics, but I really want to focus on tagants and uh, these things. My slides are different than your slides. If you want, my slides are on my website because this stuff's pretty fast kind of emerging. Uh, I'm basically an information technologist. I specialize in computer forensics. I like computer security stuff. I'm on the teaching faculty until September the 1st in which I'm going to retire. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I teach also at the College of Law and I'm one of these a few professors who actually goes to court and does something valuable. I actually testify in cases. I will testify in both a defense and prosecution. I know I'm an old guy, but I also believe everybody's entitled to a defense, even bad people. So I think that you're going to see more and more forensics examiners doing kind of a defense work and prosecution. It's a nature of the kind of time. Going across, who do I speak for? I don't speak for Department of Defense. I don't speak for the, uh, the University of Texas. I don't speak for anybody. And most of the time, I just speak for me. Okay, uh, there's no uh, kind of affiliation here. I'm, those of you that are attorneys, don't sue me. There's not warranty for fitness, implied or otherwise. So don't, don't try to sue me on that stuff. Uh, I've written some software that I have shown some of the students, but uh, basically any of the risks of material in this presentation are your risk, not mine. Uh, and if you don't agree to this, uh, then leave the tutorial. Okay, well, I'll be friends. How's that sound? Are you all right with that? You're not all right. Okay, uh, all the, those of you that want my slide set, it's at this place. I, again, I reiterate, I will not discuss every slide on the set. These cases support a notional case. Actually, this case is less notional than real. And there's a real aspect to it. I'll show you a slide uh, that actually resulted in someone deciding to cop a plea. Okay, and I'll show you a slide of how he did it. We're really going to discuss the idea of digital information. All of you know what digital information is, right? Right? Say yes. I mean, it's, it's data that's on a computer system. Surely all of you, now the students from my two-day class don't get to answer this question, but surely you would agree, Dr. Lee Brock, that all, com all, computer, all computer data stored on a typical computer is binary. Surely you would agree with that. And you would, and now the first question is when they call you doctor at trial, believe me, they're getting ready for a surprise. 
The next thing, if they ask you, if an attorney ever, ever ask you, would you agree with, trust me, you don't want to agree with it. You don't want to agree with it. Now, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Surely you would agree that all data that is stored on a typical computer system is stored in binary format, binary being one or zero. That's a reasonable proposition, isn't it? Is, is it factual? Now, we have a volunteer. Someone's going to volunteer. Someone wants to volunteer. I have a colleague from San Antonio. Would you please stand up for a second? My colleague from San Antonio, he's doing his PhD program, and PhDs you're allowed to harass. It's kind of the open deal. Now, you would agree that all data on a typical computer system would be in binary format. The first thing I want to teach technicians, buy yourself some time and say, can you repeat the question? That's the first thing. So I'll repeat the question. Surely you would agree that all data is stored in binary format on a typical computer. On a computer you would buy in a store. It would be stored in binary format. You would agree with that, right? Is he right? No, because if you print something out, if you print something out, you're storing the data in the paper format, and it's not in binary format. Okay, I have to give you the news, you have two more years in your PhD program. Have a seat. Okay, good job, good job. We're talking about digital data. Now, surely you would agree that digital data only is on computer systems, right? No? No. In fact, embedded devices, embedded devices like your automobile, Ford automobiles today carry seven onboard processors. You buy a new Ford this year? Seven onboard processors. Believe it or not, those of you that have an airbag event, it stores the last seven seconds of digital data prior to impact. And that's why that there's some, some insurance examiners like to come over to your car, over your, to the wrecking yard, take a look at your car and say, now Larry, you, are, now you tell me you're only driving 35 miles an hour. And the computer says you're driving a little faster. And my excuse was, well, I was driving in reverse. All right, that's a joke. You, got, you guys have no sense of humor, okay. We're talking about tokens, privacy, and also the idea of international forensics. And there is an international kind of standard. If you don't ask questions, again, I'm going to get to ask you questions. And, and, I, and basically, there are no bad questions in computer forensics, in digital forensics. Promise me, you will throw the person out of, his room, out of the room who says, I have all answers. I know it all. I know it all because you can't know. Because as fast as Microsoft brings out a new operating system, as fast as we see new applications, then we're going to see new challenges in terms of digital forensics. This area is exploding. Okay. Okay. It's an emerging profession. There's always the test of competency. Many of you are technicians, and you should not represent yourself as a forensics expert because there's a key notion in law almost all law, even those of you that are outside the United States, almost all judicial systems say that forensics is an expert domain. Expert has legal qualifications. Knowledge, do you have special knowledge? Knowledge that's not generally available to the public. Do you have, there's no knowledge, skills, do you use these skills in this particular matter? And you have to have experience. You cannot go to college, get a degree in forensics, and say, I'm a forensics expert. It requires KSE, knowledge, skills, and experience. Now, the typical test, it is a notion of profession, and there's always this idea that there's a generally agreed upon amount of knowledge. Some people say it's science. I disagree with that, because science says that you've got agreed upon principles. We don't have all those agreed upon principles. There's also this notion of competency. Did you apply this knowledge in an appropriate fashion? And if peers reviewed this, would they come up generally with the same conclusion? So there's a notion of peer review. It's also, you can extend the idea of peer review is, can you defend it in court? Because our, our legal system says that we are subject to kind of peer review. Trial by jury is a peer process. So consequently, now, there's been a lot of academic guys, and frankly, I'm not, I'm considered to be a wild-eyed man in computer forensics because I go to some congress, I go to conferences that are taught like by academic guys. And they tell me the theory of computer forensics and how the theory is supposed to work. And academics love theory. I mean, they, they like this. This is a big thing. This is where you get published and, and you get to be the senior, the senior faculty and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I like to ask them this tough question. How many cases have you done? Oh, I don't do cases. No, no, no. I'm an academic. I don't do cases. A lot of academics say, oh, that's, that's too applied. Oh. And then, well, my problem is that forensics doesn't occur in theory. It occurs in practice. People use computer systems to, condu to conduct a potentially inappropriate activity, or, or, or in some cases, illegal activity. 
So we have a real challenge in our profession, and we really need more of a community of practice. Now, I actually was teaching, I was teaching a class to some young computer science students where we ask a case, there's a case called US versus Steiger. Basically, a cyber vigilante broke into a computer system to recover evidence. Steiger was a child pornographer. And I was beating up on some young graduate students, and I said, well, you know, besides the technical aspects, what about this person's privacy? And the guy started this, well, privacy, you know, we've got ethical standards. And I said, well, you know, what about ethics? And he said, well, you know, ethics aside, ethics aside, I think it's okay to break into bad people's computer system to get digital evidence. And I said, ethics aside, there is no ethics aside in this kind of business. And one of the things I want you to think about are the idea of human rights, privacy, and ethics. Because if it's really going to become a profession, we have to have some kind of ethical kind of guidepost. Like, well, maybe you don't break into people's systems even though they're a great child pornographer. Maybe you get a search warrant. Maybe you do a, an appropriate seizure. And human beings have rights. And I want to talk to you about some tensions as we're going for today. Okay, you should be okay with these kind of terms. You should understand what data is. Data, typically on most computer systems, is represented as binary data, ones and zeros. It can also be represented in other kinds of formats, hexadecimal, base 16, you should understand that stuff. Those of you that want to do forensics and get it in trial, believe me, you get to explain to some people what is binary data. And some of these people are jury and juries, and they're not computer conversant. So in some cases, it's your job to explain to the jury what is data, what is metadata? Data about data. Metadata, we understand that. A fragment is, is basically defined as a, as a piece of data that is not complete within itself. For example, an entire Word document would be a file, but a portion of a Word document that was perhaps physically kind of damaged, uh, it wasn't fully complete, is called a fragment. And you see this with some kinds of hard drives that have physical kinds of destruction. I've done forensics on a drive that had a bullet hole in it. A bullet went through the drive. And part of the word file went out with a bullet. You know? And that's kind of the way those things work. You know, they, they kind of take the file out with. So you should be OK with a file. Now, you're going to hear a term token. You're going to hear a token. Hear the idea of information. Information is data or in context. You know, well, what is a fat table? And fat by itself may be a logical, a logical piece of metadata, but the information that you get out of a file allocation table is information. The idea of findings, an examiner develops findings. An examiner finds something. Either, look, the data is there or it's not. It's not whether you like the guy or not. Either the data is on the computer system. And by data, I'm using a broad representation of that. Now, surely you would agree that forensics has to do with evidence. Because a forensics examiner, clearly, that's his duty to produce evidence, not to collect a fee, right? Would you agree with that? Well, would you stand up, please? What was your name? Tracy, you would surely agree with all of us among peers that the first job of, of a forensics examiner is to produce evidence. Would you agree with that? Who else would agree with that? Who else? No? No? Yes? Do we have confusion? Oh, this is a learning moment. I've got you on the cutting edge of confusion, on your cutting edge. Evidence. Evidence can occur in the US. Be careful, not in all trial systems. But in the US, only in one place, the trier of fact. Someone who is actually going to hear both sides, the information, and that person is the person who determines evidence. Now, attorneys can submit stuff. You can submit stuff, and they can say, well, I'm going to submit something as evidence. But it's ultimately the trier of fact, the judge. There are rules of evidence. There are the rules that I don't want to go through in class. Those of you that want to, you can go through a semester-long class dealing with evidence at law school. And you will find it either fascinating or the most boring topic you've ever dealt with in your life. Evidence. Now, the point I want to make is here, you generate what I would call items of note or informations of evidentiary value, but you don't produce evidence. But also, you have specialized knowledge. It's not knowledge that you develop in the course. You can't go to this course and say, well, now I've got all the knowledge, because you have to apply it. it has to, you have to have some kind of standardization. And ultimately, you have to make judgments. One of the great things in the US is forensics examiners, as an expert, are excluded from the hearsay rule. It's not what you heard, not what you read in a book. You are an expert. You are allowed to present evidence, and they can't play the hearsay game with you. Now, remember, these are US rules. In Mexico, I've tested in, in, in uh, a trial in Mexico. 
they have no notion of they have no notion of evidence in terms of a procedure. It's whatever the judge likes. If the judge likes you and you say log files work this way, he believes you. If he doesn't like it, you can have all the log files hashed in the world and he's not going to take it. So it's ultimately, remember, there's certain kinds of jurisdictional issues. For the purpose of this class, we're really going to focus on civil kinds of procedures because that's where most forensics is now typically occurring, not criminal. Okay, forensics. Who can give me a definition of forensics? By the way, don't look in your slide books because it's not there. Come on, who can tell me what forensics is besides these three gentlemen in the front because I beat them up earlier yesterday? Come on, somebody can tell me what forensics is. You watch, you watch forensics on television. You, you, you see crime stoppers. Please stand up, sir. Please stand up and share your knowledge with the class. First, uh, what is your name? Paul, are you a competent uh, a forensics examiner? Have you conducted any forensics training? No. Have you ever done forensics? No. Have you ever been married? No. These are sample questions. Get ready for it. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Does it have to be a crime? Does it have to be analysis? Does it have to be factual? Or can you, as a forensics examiner, have something that they call a forensics throwdown? Well, I'm being charged $20,000 for this case. There's no evidence here, so I'll just throw some extra stuff on the system. I can do that, right? Yeah. No? No. Who, who, what is the first duty of a forensics examiner? What is the first responsibility of a forensic examiner? I know some of you are mercenaries and say, collect the fee. <laughs> collect the fee. Some of you are going, wait a second. The first duty is to appear smart. The, the second duty, or perhaps the first duty is make an attorney look ignorant. We all like that, right? Impress the judge. Who can, who can tell me, number one, what is the first duty of a forensic examiner? Those of you that have been in class know. I pound this through their heads. Who, give me an idea. How about to tell the truth? Whether it's good for your litigation team, whether you're working for defense, or even prosecution. The examiner's report is nobody's report but his. It's his report. He has a first duty to tell the truth. Yes, there are cases in the United States of forensics examiners who kind of shape their report. And that you can be guilty of some fairly unpleasant charges. Now, the idea of using a forensics throwdown. Oh, I, I couldn't find the hacking tool on Johnny's box, like we did that hacker court thing. So therefore, I'll just go ahead and stuff an application down there. I just throw a piece of evidence on it, and therefore I can bill the guy. That's called spoliation, or the intentional destruction or contamination of evidence. It's a federal offense, even if you do it in a civil, civil matter, it's punishable up to five years in a slammer. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. Okay, forensics, I'm going to force a definition out of you whether you like it or not. You don't have to like my definition, but you better have one if you get involved in trial. Okay, forensics. Number one. It has, you have to, when you take any digital device, the competent examiner has to have a seizure. He has to be able to get the data from somewhere. Now, in the federal government, they say, just, just give me the hard drive. It's not good enough for me. I don't want the hard drive. I want what I call the corpus. I want the whole computer system, because there's lots of data on computer systems that are really important. And I, I like to do the full seizure. The seizure is basically where you also take custody of the device. In a legal sense, you are now assuming the custody of that device. If you lose the device, you have problems. I've once read a report by a forensic examiner who said, well, we didn't lose the disk drive, we just can't find it. Oh, I understand that, we can't find it, okay. So you've gotta, you've gotta record this, contemporaneous kind of notes. Then you have to do something called a forensics acquisition. And this is normally a bit streamed copy of the binary data that resides on both the physical and the logical devices. Unfortunately, many of my federal colleagues just say, I just want the logical device. No, no, I want the physical device also because I'll show you there's metadata and special types of tokens and tagins on this disk data that can really establish this device that was perhaps used or misused in that particular environment. Then you have to do an analysis. Now the analysis can require some really expensive tools. You can spend twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, $40,000, or you can use a hex editor. And I have used a simple freeware hex editor to actually show stuff in trial. But the tool has to be 
correct? It can have some errors, right? Or do, wait a second, you mean all, Larry, are you saying all forensics tools have to be perfect? In other words, there must be no error? In other words, this tool was given to us by God. God. God put this shrink wrap on it and said, there's no way this tool can make an error. We all know that's not possible. Forensics, every piece of software, every piece of software potentially has some error. And it's okay if you, an examiner, say, yes, I understand a tool can have error. And what's the first thing you can do about looking at a tool error? Well, you cross-validate the item with another tool. Cross-validation. In this case, the acquisition is normally done as a bitstream copy, where you can do some voodoo stuff. It's basically, it's basically, it sucks all the data off the drive, and make sure you've got the data on both the suspect device and the replicated device. You perform hashes. Now, the government says CRC is okay. CRC is a communications hash. I don't think so, because we can spoof CRC. And so I prefer MD5s. And I'm paid to be paranoid. So I always hash my drive three times. I hash it MD5, SHA-1, and perhaps SHA-2. Just, just hash it. And therefore, I don't get involved in the argument about, well, could we have a hash collision or not? And then by the time the attorney wants to ask the question, the judge, when you start talking about hash collisions, the judge wants to kind of move on to the next topic. He just kind of wants to move on. But it's your job to make sure that you've done a good acquisition. You never, well, never is a long time. In most forensics investigations, you don't want to actually touch the original device. You want to copy the data from it. There's a specialized part of law that's called, an, you have to have what's called an intrusive order. This drive was blown up or thrown in the water or an Iraqi shot a gun through it, who knows? And the idea of the drive is so flaky that by just touching it, you may lose data. And then your job is to alert all parties and say, wait a second, this drive is really flaky, and by, by just touching it, I may destroy the data. And generally, the finder effect notifies all parties. Those are rare. Most cases, you just want to pull the, the media device off the unit, physical unit, put a blocker on it, suck the data through it. Evidence files. You all know what an evidence file is? That's basically a bitstream hashed CRC uh, authentic copy of the correct, of the correct logical data structures on the system, files, folders, metadata. It can also pick up file fragments. Sometimes it will pick up certain areas called tokens, but I'll show you why it doesn't necessarily work. Then after you do the analysis, then you prepare a report. I like real to sync reports because they get long. Number one, you're not there to educate the, the, the other side. You're not there to even educate your own counsel. I like a short report. I also believe they teach in law school. Write something down, you get to defend it. As we know from our former president, what is the meaning of the? Remember all that? Okay, same thing. So we want to basically have a really short, succinct report. If you're dealing with a, a server compromise, the best thing to do is crank out an executive summary and make it sure it's in English, because there are some people that don't, that don't truly get off the idea of logical block addressing. I mean, that, that doesn't mean that they didn't light their fire. And so sometimes you actually like to work with a team of people. One guy who's a, who's a forensics geek, and one guy who's a human being, and they can kind of help generate the report. Okay. Then after you report it, one of the great things in the United States, you get to report it, and then all sides, all parties get the report. In the U.S. now, increasingly, particularly even in military prosecutions, they will hire a defense forensics examiner. That used to be okay, the guy would just say, well, I just want to review the report. Not me. I don't want the report. I want the image file. In some cases, I want the original device. Some of you are going, well, wait, wait a second, Larry. What can you tell from that? I mean, if I get the physical device. Well, I've seen a device that was manufactured in 1996, and the guy said the unit ran perfectly. We popped the top on the unit, and we noticed that it had a hard drive that was built in 1999. What's the discrepancy? Oh, I forgot to tell you about that other one. I didn't, I, I forgot that. Oh, you forgot that. Well, and you said that you never used the device, right? You never had the device on the network, right? Well, why were there micro scratches on the connection of the unit? Oh, I, I forgot to tell you I was using the network. Oh, then why did we see with, with, a, with a, dental, a dental camera, why did we observe micro scratches in the USB connection? Oh, yeah, I remembered about the USB. I did have some USB. Yeah, okay, and then let me ask one other question. When we did a forensics analysis on XP, we noticed you had some shared files on some, on some, on a share, on a website called Wares. What does Wares mean? Oh, I forgot to tell you about that. So, so what I'm saying is you want the full corpus. The, the unit may be only the hand, but you, what you want is the full body. Will you do a forensics across everything in the body? No, but you've got to make some judgments. 
And my thing is, I like to do a physical seizure. I also like to also look at the physical aspects of the unit. Now, those of you that really want to be paranoid, there's a case in Great Britain of a, actually someone who actually vacuumed the keyboard on the unit and pulled off residue that actually showed this guy was been in another country. So there's residue. There have been anecdotal reports from some three-letter agency that I've heard that there's normally enough residue on your hands, those of you that consumed, what do they call that stuff? Cocaine, something like that or something. I live in another world. So in Texas, our fund is drinking Lone Star beer, right? So, so you know, reportedly, there's enough residue on a cocaine user's hands to actually show that this person has been interacting with cocaine. Doesn't necessarily say saying he's consuming it, but he's interacting with it. So I want to argue again that physically, the physical aspects can tell you a lot about this particular device. Now, again, one of the great things about computer forensics is everybody can have a theory. And I can write up a report that convinces you that Elvis Presley was actually here at Black Hat. I can write that report, but then I get to defend it. The problem is in the United States, between a report and a defense, it can be as long as six to seven years. So you have a duty to return the report and then you also get to safeguard the data because you're going to probably have to go back to court and defend this against the Department of Army. The Department of Army may say, well, wait a second, what this, what this report you did five years ago is because it takes us that long to, to, to process. And there are, uh, there are forensics examiners that I know of that still have a forensics report done on Apple II. They're waiting to defend. They're waiting to defend. So you get to, you get to store this stuff. And those of you that don't have enough room in your house and your wife starts complaining about it, you get a new wife because you're going to have to store it. You're going to have to store the stuff. Now, forensics has to be expert findings derived from information associated, not necessarily on, but associated with a digital platform and binary data. Most cases. I'm okay. Now, these findings really have value to the trier of fact in legal and administrative hearings. Most corporations in America, by Fortune 1000s, do forensics. They get an employee who's kind of going around with inappropriate sites, or they have a vice president who's actually maybe sending intellectual property out to somebody, and they do those kind of things. They rarely go to trial. They rarely go to trial. They may go to trial for a wrongful termination. There's a case in Texas of a young gentleman who was kind of in your face, an in your face data processing guy, and he basically was re reportedly going to inappropriate websites. The AUP, the acceptable use policy, was pretty lackadaisical. You should only go to good sites. Who knows what good is, right? And he didn't have, he wasn't, this wasn't part of his employment contract. And one, one female employee who he was promoted over didn't like this. So what'd she do? I, I saw him looking at a pornographic website. They asked the guy to come down to HR's office. While he was down at HR's office, they sent up the HR executive to look at his computer system. The HR executive, this is a live computer system, sits down in front of it, system's already up, no password, and what does he find? <gasps> Pornography. They escorted the gentleman out of the building. They actually made the mistake by saying, John Smith was terminated for inappropriate use. Now, what do you think happened to John Smith? Is John Smith, is, is his career over? Is he finished? He's laying, on Hawaii, he's laying in Hawaii wondering whether his right side is tanned better than his left side. Because basically, it was not a competent forensics investigation. The examiner had zero training. The examiner had no notion of when you log onto a computer system, you change the state of data. And there's this great doctrine called the fruit of the poison tree in law school. And evidence obtained through an inappropriate matter where the data is contaminated is considered to be fruit of the poison tree and must be excluded from trial. So all the evidence on his computer system, and by the way, what they call pornography, you and I can see by walking down this building. <laughs> this, was a, this was a Texas evangelical group. You know, they're concerned about any skin, you know, they want to wear so But this guy basically, so what they call pornography, and they got to settle, they got to, he, he got an employment attorney involved and the employment attorney assisted him in removing a lot of the company's cash from their wallet and putting it in his wallet. So he's now in Hawaii working on a suntan. So all I'm saying is forensics, particularly, it will occur not only in criminal settings, but also in civil settings. Now these, in most cases, are now gonna be really resolved, not in criminal matters, but increasingly in civil matters, just the way it goes. Yeah.
Yes. Yes. In fact, there's two cases that I'm personally involved in right now where the company was actually monitoring traffic, monitoring traffic and telling people, um, you know, oh, we're not going to monitor you. And there, but there's no question. There is absolutely no question. There, Yes, yes they can. Um, one case is they have a fiduciary duty to protect data. There's a case of a um, young woman who basically uh, had a laptop computer and the, the laptop computer she was told could, she can use for her personal use. Um, it, that was part of the AUP, it was, it was part of her contract, she could use this computer. And the company, when they were doing a uh, reconstruction of this device, found that, in fact, she was using the system for taking some uh, pictures of herself and her boyfriend. And then, unfortunately, the systems administrator thought this would be a cool thing to circulate. Again, she's working on her suntan in Hawaii. It's the left side versus she's, she's doing good. <laughs> uh, there's also some questions about can companies really monitor certain kinds of transactions. Content filtering may, in fact, constitute uh, a section, uh, a, um, a, a, a USC kind of a wiretap. But don't walk out of this room, even if you have your own personal computer and think that data on there, if you connect to a, if you connect to a corporate network, is your data. Courts have held over and over again, even using your own network on their infrastructure makes it your, your system, but their data. They own your data, no question about that. All right. Uh, now, it doesn't matter, there's about 15 kind of examinate, there's 15 terms in terms of forensics. You may hate mine, I don't care, but when you get to court someday, you get to come up with your definition, because the first thing they're going to ask you is, are you a forensics expert? And if you answer yes, it's if then else, then okay, tell me what your definition of computer forensics is. Tell me what courses you've been to, tell me what schools you've been to, tell me the number of examinations you've done, and the number of cases that you've testified, and also tell me how much you're being paid in this case. Compensation is discoverable. And frankly, your entire life history is discoverable. In my case, I'm one of the few PhDs in America that grew up in a trailer park in West Texas. I'm one of the few guys that actually was expelled from high school my senior year for setting my cousin's hair on fire with a Roman candle. But he needed it. He needed it. And of course, I get, I get asked that at court. Have you, have you ever been convicted of anything? No. Have you ever had any administrative proceedings? Well, yes, Your Honor. My principal in Archer City, Texas, said that I was a menace to, menace to society. I still thank him. God rest his soul. So all I'm saying is your entire history is discoverable. And normally, if you're really good, they're going to go back and find out, well, Larry, why'd you fire the Roman candle at him? Well, I didn't have a skyrocket. That's what. That's it. Okay. Okay. So you're okay with that. Okay. So we got forensics defined. Okay. Now, I, I want to convince you that computer forensics is too narrow of an item. item. Even my colleague goes back in the class says, ah, oh, this is all cool stuff, but I want to get involved with some really advanced stuff. Well, look, IT technology is everywhere. It's in your car. It's in your air conditioner. In fact, it's in a lot of devices you're not even aware of. Technology everywhere is embedded in everything. Now, there was some congressman somewhere a while back, and he had some congressional aide. You remember that deal a while back? And he at first said, I never knew the woman. I never knew her. I'm from California, and she was in California, and I saw her once at a party and never, know, never knew her. Well, he was asked in a, in a civil matter, actually it was incorrect, in a criminal matter, the, the, uh, the law enforcement can come in and say, uh, to aid discovery, we'd like to have you to agree to a discovery order. And the discovery order says, bring your stuff down. Bring your stuff, bring your stuff on down. And so he thought, well, you know, I'll just come on down. And they said, well, no, no, he said, bring your stuff. And he said, well, you know, here's my office computer. And they said, no, no, I want your home computer. I want your home ISP. I want your cell phone. I want your PDA. I want your cell phone records. And I want your BlackBerry account, too, by the way. And by the way, we also want to look at your car. Now, he brought all this stuff down, and they, and basically, those of you that feds understand this, that basically they kind of get you in the room after they, after they do the initial survey, the initial survey, and those of you that feds will tell you about this, that they say, now, you know, we think you're a good guy. Now, door one would be for you to cooperate. We want you to cooperate and go with us down door one. But if you don't want to do that, you can go down door two. Now, we have found that through your cell phone records, you were making some calls 
from her, her condominium. Because cell phones triangulate. When you pick up a phone call, make a telephone call, the telephone company keeps records of where the stations we're talking to. So you simply do a little kind of geometry, do a little kind of polar coordinates, and guess what? We also discovered that he had some email in the system. Oh yeah, I remember her now, so I think, yes, I will cooperate. I think door one's looking a lot better than door two. And that's the way the Fed's kind of working on this kind of deal. Now, technology is everywhere, global connectivity. You know, we know we're always on. Those of you that are on cable modems, you, you know you get scanned by guys all day long. Now, I also want to argue that one of the things that we're finding increasingly interesting is we use pro products like Copernic, which actually search people's web postings. Oh, I never went to that site. Well, why'd you post here? Uh, well, I never joined this Usenet web group. And we basically pull down the entire sites. Those of you in some cases are interested in this, we use a tool called WGET. Yank down the entire contents of the site and produces, a, well, particularly on guys who write viruses. And they like to post their kind of stuff on sites. We yank this stuff down. In fact, we've even yanked stuff down internationally. And using WGET is OK. It's not considered to be intrusive. All right. Now, if you stand back and look at this, digital devices, these are the enablers for business. All of you are working on jobs that five years ago, three people did. Now they have one person, and you're doing all this work, and they're giving you all this cool technology. They're giving you a fax machine at home. They're giving you a pager. They're giving you three computers, a 21-inch monitor, an ISP, so you can all die at a heart attack by the time, by, by time you're 40, right? So, but they're getting productivity out of you. Now, what's going on increasingly is we have non-criminal use, which is OK, but non-criminal means non-criminal. I've even seen a case of a young technologist, made a lot of money from an unnamed computer company. And like young men do, he married early in life. He married, and his wife perhaps didn't keep herself up. No, in Texas they would say, she's gone fat. She got big. <laughs> she's gone fat. And, but she could cook. She could cook. There's no question about that. She could cook. But this guy wanted, you know, he had his money from this large computer corporation, and he decided he wanted to trade this family model, the cook, in for a sports edition, as young men would do. So he makes the mistake of telling his wife, you know, I'm really kind of bored with you, and you know, your food isn't any good, and frankly, you're fat, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go take my uh, two-week retreat. Now, she was born at night, but not last night, and she kind of saw what was coming around here. So he decides he's going to go on his retreat, and his retreat involved an exotic dancer named Jade. And he took the exotic dancer named Jade, uh, and he made reservations to come to Las Vegas. He came to Las Vegas with Jade, but he made the reservations over the internet, and he made the reservations on his home computer. Now, he was obviously going to Las Vegas not to work on his computer. So being a smart young man, he thought, well, you know, I better move fast and just, I don't need this computer. I got some other appliances I need, so I just leave this one here, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, he left his computer there. His wife decides she's gonna go visit an attorney, a very mean attorney. This attorney is a skilled, skilled civil litigator. He specializes in divorce. And he heard the history about how this guy had millions of dollars and was, perhaps doing some inappropriate things. And then she, after her first interview, said, well, you know, I really want to sue for divorce. And the guy said, are you absolutely sure? And he said, yeah, I want to sue, I want to sue, sue for divorce. And uh, a forensics examiner, who will be unnamed here, got to, a forensics examiner got to, uh, uh, I got a telephone call saying, could you come to my office? There is a computer system I want you to look at. The computer system was in a, brought to his office. The computer system was acquired. The data was pulled off of it, photographed, all that kind of stuff and then a report was generated. The gentleman came back from Las Vegas with Jade. And he, as he was getting off the airplane, he just had a kind of cold feeling. <laughs> and that cold feeling was validated by he was served with a divorce in Texas. They still have this idea, it's not necessarily you know, community property, everything is like, if the wife has been wrong, she gets more. And if he's been a kind of an okay guy, he doesn't have to give more. But in this case, he, gets, he decides that, well, okay, if, if, if that, my fat wife doesn't want, a, doesn't want a, uh, a marriage, I'll go make a new life, and by the way, I'll just pay her 50%. And she said, nah, I don't want 50%, I'd like to have 90. <laughs> it's okay. And then so she decides that uh, she, she hires an attorney. 
I mean, sorry, he, ha he hires an attorney. And his attorney says, kind of, let's make a deal. And this professor, who appeared to be just kind of involved with the forensics, got to go to court. But he was never sent through depositions. In other words, the other side didn't know what the guy had. They roll into court. They roll into court. And the guy, the, the defendant, defendant gets called up the stand. First question out of his mouth is, do you own a computer? Yes. Is it your computer? Yes. What kind of computer is it? So and so and so and so. Do you go to pornographic websites? No. Now you're telling the court you've never been to a pornographic website. Oh. Now, Mr. Smith, have you been faithful in your marriage? Well, yes. Now you're telling the court you've been faithful. Yes. Now, Mr. F now, Mr. Smith, are you a liar? I take offense at that. Oh no. no. By liar, you've reported all your assets, haven't you? Oh yes. And his attorney scratched his head like, what is this going on? And they called up the forensic examiner. This guy happened to have a PhD. But he was kind of listed as kind of, they thought this, his attorney didn't understand, his attorney didn't run the web traps on this boy. And he gets up and he, they produce the report. They produce the report and now all parties get the report, including the judge. Then we go through the demonstrative exhibit. Exhibit one, you ever seen these graphic platters, these plotters from HP? Well, we have these pictures of, his electronic ticket going to, going to Las Vegas. We have a picture of his credit card receipt from a large hotel that starts with a C. <laughs> okay. we, have a, we have a picture of his receipt that shows this guy's buying not only jewelry on this deal, but lots of champagne. Then we go through his computer system that shows email to her. And of course, he, his attorney's moving to strike, and, he, and the judge says, shut up and sit down. Son, I, I want to look at these pictures. And then we see a picture. <laughs> then we see the naked pictures. Then we go through his MS Money account, which had a couple of million dollars he forgot to report that was kind of in Barbados. Now the judge kind of looks at his watch about 11 o'clock and says, ah, kind of time for an early break. Why don't you two see if you can get together and work some stuff out? And believe me, after lunch, he got 90%, and he got down the road. So all I'm trying to tell you is these are also now being used in non-criminal activities and you're going to see a lot more of it. There is no question that companies can be subpoenaed to produce email that involves a particular plaintiff in a divorce case. No question. Yes, sir. Well, but you, you, you okay. If there's the contemplation, if there's the contemplation of a civil or a criminal discovery session, it is contemplated you are proscribed from destroying anything. Now, not necessarily filing. If you, if you are contemplating that, that John Smith may get a divorce and John Smith's attorney or wife may, may subpoena that device, you, you are proscribed from your stop from destroying it. No question. No question. Okay, so I want you to kind of think about these kind of terms as we're talking about forensics and tokens. Now. I want to talk to you about, about this idea of tagins, which is kind of considered to be on the cutting edge of this weird business, and a token, and I'll drive some terms. I could beat you up anymore, but there's an, a, an item of data or metadata that is intentionally or perhaps unintentionally in place in a device or file, typically by the designer or manufacturer. All of you carry, what do they call these little things? They used to call them thumb drives. Now they call them micro drives or something, these kind of things. And we all know that these things are produced, right? They're, they're produced and ours are all the same. Surely you would agree with me. They're all the same. Surely you would agree with me. No, no. In fact, those of you can crank down a little hex editor here. In fact, we'll see this thing here for a second. This is a hex editor of a drive, of this particular drive. You can see it over here. Now, this is really advanced forensics. This is a freeware hex editor that you can pull down called uh, WinHex. There's several of them around. Those of you in Department of Defense, I think you guys paid $12 zillion for this. All of us get it free. That's a joke. That's a joke. That's a, yeah. I mean, what's the purpose of having a conference if I can't offend everyone, right? I mean, come on. Okay, WinHex removable media. I'd like you to look at the device. This shows deleted files. Yeah. And if you go to the top of the unit, there is some metadata at the top. And that metadata the memory stick itself actually shows 
the manufacturing date of the unit. Okay? I'm having a little systems problem here as usual. All computers are hating me. And there's a metadata here. Uh, depending on the manufacturer, you will actually see in some cases, this is of course the FAT file system, but in some, in some of the systems on the very front, they'll keep the uh, in serial number in the unit. I was trying to get the hex offset. It should be working. Hang on, I don't know what's going on here. Now, another example, many of you, many of you use cameras. And you would see, and obviously, a picture. This is a real picture, by the way, it was used in a case. These are some gentlemen who are getting on a flight to Switzerland. The reason we know it's Switzerland and the Swiss port, and we also did some stuff in Photoshop actually looking at the picture. And the guy says, I was no way I was in Switzerland. There was no way. There was no way I was there. He said, well, your camera. Where's your camera? Oh, I can't find my camera. Oh, I bet you can find your camera. So we simply looked at this picture, opened it up again using a freeware tool called a hex editor. And we simply looked at this particular picture using a hex editor. Canon picks, and you'll see something called XF. This is all the, ca the, the Canon PowerShot S400. That's the date the picture was made, the date that's recorded on the particular camera, and later in this stream here, there's also an, an additional, um, additional parts of information, and on some cameras, it actually shows the version of firmware, and there is a serial number embedded in the system. This is the firmware version R98. Now, this is called EXIF format. I mean, you go, well, you know, I know all about that. Well, there's some terrorism people who don't, because the gentleman, Mr. Pearl, as they were shooting him, they took some photographs of Mr. Pearl. They posted on his website. In fact, using a handy-dandy hex editor, Larry Liebrock looked at the picture, and I can tell you the exact time the picture was made. Now, yes, you can edit this. You can edit an EXIF, but, you know, most people don't necessarily think about that stuff. There's a tension between convenience and... Uh, how do I prove it? Well, real simple. I hashed it. I hashed it here, and I hashed it on this camera. I hashed it equals, hash is equal, and then game over. Game over. He also, this picture was made with successive pictures of him and his girlfriend. So I've got corroborative evidence. I don't have to have a perfect case. I just have to be, as they, as they say in West Texas, good enough. Just good enough. Okay? Now, what I'm trying to tell you is there's metadata every, uh, around. Uh, in this morning's paper, there's a discussion about a new GPS, uh, uh, GPS-enabled Palm Pilot. That's going to be great, great evidence stuff. Great. <laughs> lifetime employability. Lifetime employability. Now, one of the things I also love to do is evidence files. Remember I say I always demand an evidence file? I want the evidence file. One of the things I love to look at is they tell me the dates of, of the evidence file, and being a typical paranoid guy I am, I also want to see what the evidence file is. And I actually look at a hex here, a hex view. And this is actually the bitstream image of the entire evidence file, and it should be digitally signed. If it's not signed, somebody's been cooking the books, which occasionally that happens, right? I mean, paranoid being it is. Now, all I'm trying to say is you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just need to get yourself a hex editor and start looking at this kind of stuff and pulling down information. Now, these information that's built in manufacturing is called a tagant. It may be put there intentionally. It may be a defect. On most drives, hard drives, there's something called an ESN, basically a, a, a service serial number. That is a drive serial number that is normally not part of the logical partition, but is part of the physical partition and identifies that drive as unique. It's built as part of manufacturing, a tagant. A token is something that results in the user. The user has interacted with the system. Now, how many of you know that your file systems are really, you understand your file systems pretty well, right? Now, if, surely you would agree with me. If I open a file, I don't touch it at all, and save it, the state of the file is identical. Surely you would agree with me. How many Photoshop users do you have here? Anybody use Photoshop? Crank, what is the current version, seven? What's the current version of, of, of Photoshop? Seven. Crank up version seven with a cold six pack of Dr. Pepper, or those of you who live in West Texas, Lone Star Beer, Shiner Bach, whatever. 
I want you to pull up, pull up a JPEG picture. I want you to hash it but, but before you open up Photoshop. Hash it. Come up with a hash. I want you to open up the same picture. Don't ch touch anything and save it. Hash it again. I will guarantee you a six pack of cold beer. And I'll throw in Monica Lewinsky. Okay, so it's a joke. Come on. By the way, I've heard she's coming, she's coming to the University of Texas. That's what I've heard. Anyway, that's why I'm leaving. <laughs> now, now, I'll get you, bet you that hash does not match. Photoshop, unobtrusively and unknown to most users, actually stuffs some pixels in the image. And therefore, if you know where those pictures are, and if you really want to, if you really want to be geeky about it, crank out WinDiff and a diff and find out exactly where they are. And therefore, you can prove that a picture has been, at some point, a picture somewhere in the chain has been modified, and this token has been stuffed in it. Now, we tried to get Adobe to admit that, and they said, well, we don't want to admit that. I said, well, we can go do door one or door two, and I'm going to have, I'm going to have door two, I'm going to have Judge Fred Edwards in Conroe, Texas, send you a motion to produce. And you either come on down on Monday, or we'll go throw you in jail on Thursday, your choice. So software companies can be made to produce this stuff. They don't like it. And I want to tell you something here. Some, I got some Microsofties in this room, I know that. Microsoft says, you can't have a source code? Well, I got a judge in West Texas says I can have it. If I, need the, if I need that source code for a trial, you can have a motion to produce. Okay, so we're okay here? We're okay with that? There's no question Windows, the Windows operating system does crank through and store the, the first date of install. The registry has it in there. The registry has when the system was last shut down. And those are an example of tokens, tokens. The registry is a rich area for tokens. And yes, those of you that are even on a vendetta against Microsoft, even Linux does that, does that stuff of when the system was installed. And even Solaris. Okay, you see here, we're only on slide 16. Uh, one of the big problems in computer forensics, among a lot of my, uh, my DOD colleagues, I use that term loosely, you know, uh, that, you know they really focus on the, what's on the disk and the data. I think we ought to spend a lot more time now looking at tokens and tagants, particularly to bind a particular person to a platform. Now, what's interesting is a lot, a lot of the anti-forensics work seems to, be, seems to be focused on how do I delete data from a particular system, system how do I use a shredder. This again is not rocket scientist from my earlier colleague this morning was telling us how easy it is and how a national security agency doesn't know what they're doing. But by the way, I'm sure he'll be indicted within a couple of hours anyway. That's another joke. This file encryption process is the classic way. There's a trial in California where the defense was, well, you guys were not able to break the encryption and we didn't want to give you the key, therefore you can't make the case. Well, number one, in, in the United States, you can be forced to produce your encryption. No question, ask Mr. Mitnick wherever you are, right? Okay, now, there is no legal test, there is no legal requirement that you bust every encrypted file in the system. And the idea is, well, if you can't bust it, you can't convict me? Uh-uh, uh-uh. Okay, so file encryption is, is an increasing way to get rid of data. You also can use, you can buy these really complicated tools, Shredder, Evidence Eliminator, and these things in some cases do an okay job. I've actually seen one that actually it deletes the starting, in, in the starting extent of the file, the ending extent, but leaves its logical pointer in the file allocation table or master boot record. Unfortunately, one of the tools actually also shreds files, but it leaves the registry alone, and it shows when Johnny installed Evidence Eliminator. It shows that. Okay, so, so, so Johnny gets to explain those things. Okay, uh, we also, this is a, a classic anti-forensics application that I saw a guy use. This guy insisted that, he told the court, I'm, an, I'm just an introductory computer, I'm an introductory computer user. He had a, uh, a, a Dell 8200, half a gig of memory, 80 gig drive, and he had four partitions on his drive. Three of them were scrubbed. He said, and we asked him, well, why do you have a master boot partition? He said, well, you know, I, I want to use it to keep, keep private data. Well, wh where was the data? Oh, well, I, sh I scrubbed it. And, well, when did you scrub it? Oh, I don't remember. Well, the data shows, the system shows it was scrubbed the day that you were ordered to produce it. Well, let me get this again. The judge says you're ordered to produce it and you scrubbed it. Yeah, I, I did. I got nervous. And the judge said, well, I'm sorry you're nervous because you're also guilty. <laughs> yeah. You're guilty. And it's called summary judgment. And, and the law says, wait a second, if you destroy evidence that, that could support a notion of conviction, we assume then therefore you're guilty. 
So just come on down. Just, just start paying your fine or go to jail. All right. And so this is going to be a pretty exciting area for a lot of you and shredders. Those of you that are interested, there's some pretty interesting STEG applications. There's a good STEG course and a good STEG tool here. STEG is a real exciting kind of area, but don't assume that it takes a lot of stuff. I've actually seen a PowerPoint file that had embedded underneath it basically some crypt keys on how to break into a server. And the guy was sending a PowerPoint that was on top of a particular kind of good old Word document. So STEG is information hiding, and it's kind of cool stuff. Those of you that know about this stuff, um, and I've only seen one case of actually STEG being used in a criminal case. Oh, remote data hiding, there's ways you can buy these devices now and actually put encryption on them. You know all about this stuff. And I'm interested in like iPods. iPods are firewire devices. Yes, there's metadata on iPod. And I know of one case of a guy actually using it to keep his wares on his iPod, carrying around, carrying around to it. So again, the takeaway here is when you do a seizure, get it all. I mean, just get it all. Even though they say, well, Larry, you don't need the computer system. I was called by a colleague of mine in San Antonio. He says, we, Larry, we know the guy's a druggie, man. We know the guy's a druggie. We can't figure out what's on the system. We can't find any drug date on it. And I said, where's the computer? I oh, Larry, it's in the storage room. He said, no, I want the computer. Guy was a Spanish language, Spanish, Spanish suspect using an Arabic keyboard. You can search all day long for the word drug that computer system, you're not going to find drug. You're not, you're not, you're not going to find drug. Drug doesn't exist in that computer system. Doesn't exist. Different term. OK, so remote kind of hiding data. And we come back over here. Some theory. Now, the big exciting time for all of you is privacy stuff. You know, Windows XP has got a lot of this cool stuff, but it keeps track of a lot of data, a lot of data on your, particular, on, on your computer system. Now, particularly on clients, increasingly, cops, when they come in, particularly post 9-11, they want to seize the client. There's no question that a couple of the, uh, the guys who were killing people in Washington, that they actually went through the system and showed where the system came from, when it was built, when it was booted, and that's being used in actually that case in Washington, D.C. now. Okay? So the clients are particularly exciting areas for a lot of computer forensics. You should be okay in walking out of this class to understand that you are not a forensics expert by the basis of this class. You should also understand there are really five kind of things you need to think about. How you seize it, how you acquire analysis, reporting, and ultimately safeguarding, where you get to live with the data for un until you go to trial. Okay, coming back over here, privacy. Let me see here, privacy. We use computer systems on a day-to-day -day evidence. There's been lots of questions now about using computer systems in surveillance. You are all aware of something called DCS-1000. You should be familiar with a tool that's called Silent Runner, which basically sets underneath the packet level, and you can actually use that to enumerate systems. There is forensics technology around for people to remotely acquire your disk. A company called Encase can shove a servlet on your system and basically acquire the system without your knowledge. Just, you just basically suck it down across the wire. Law enforcement seems to be wanting to use a lot of this, and one of the things I'm troubled with is we've been basically using a lot of these computer uh, forensics techniques uh, against people that are broadly called terrorists. And in many cases, they're not terrorists, but we're, well, I think we're overusing some of this stuff. We have a real challenge in our society because in my opinion, computers are not just a digital file box. They represent your personality, your aspirations, your needs, how you organize your file systems, what do you find interesting in life. And unfortunately, some of these devices can be used to evade your privacy in the hope of, well, maybe you're a terrorist. And I'm concerned about stuff like that. I think we as a society haven't come to grips with those kind of things. Increasingly in civil disputes, there are, the lawyers have lists of stuff like, just come on down. They've got a form, just bring it all down, and they get these motions to produce. It, there is apparently an Enron, we, they have seized over 35 terabytes of data. Now, God knows how they're going to find the word guilty in that thing. But, you know, it's, it's a big problem. Okay, so I, I want you to think about the tensions between privacy and government, particularly in what you're seeing now uh, across the United States. Okay, um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, we've got some responses. I actually have seen a, a system that was running XP out of RAM, totally RAM, where if the cop knocks on the door, I'm going to yank the plug in the box. That's a great technique until you're in West Texas and you get a little thunderstorm, and the thunderstorm it knocks the power down because you're going to lose all your data. These are the kind of responses I think people are thinking about for their privacy. They're looking at tools to go ahead and basically have shredders, anti-forensics applications, special kinds of encryption. Also, they're building basically hard drives on a wire so they can yank them out if the bad guys come in, or the good guys, whatever. So going to the end of this thing, emerging tensions. I don't see a real clear 
clear way. I see the government wanting to do more forensics. I see prosecutors and defense attorneys wanting to do more forensics. And yet I see, I see the civil population depending on computer systems more and more. I don't have the answers here, so, but I'm retiring and I'm turning the keys over to all of you. How's that sound? Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, right. Well, the, the Fifth Amendment basically gives you the right for, it, it gives you the The government has, has made, it's like your house. You know, your house is supposed to be your home, but the government can, can force you to open your particular home and find information in, in your home that may be used against you. Just like, therefore, they can force you to give you the key to your computer and use that information against you. And there's been held to be no Fifth, atten fifth Amendment tension. Okay? There's also no question that you can be compelled to produce your keys. In Great Britain, you can. All right? All right? Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks.